very welcome to all my existing clients and um, all of the new people that are here today. Um, it is, it's nice to see you here and I hope we're going to see you in the future again because we've got regular webinars on very interesting topics that's very informative and that could help your business. So uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Cecilia Denton. I'm an industrial psychologist and I'm the owner of PTES Consulting. We are psychometric assessment specialists and we provide HR support together with HR Talk. Um, included in this presentation today, we're going to talk about body language and nonverbal communication. Um, I hope you're going to find it as interesting as I have because it's, it's just a very interesting topic. It could help your business when you do interviews or when you um, liaise with clients or, or do deals with, with your um, clients. So I hope that you're also going to learn um, from this today. All right, so what we will be covering, um, I'm going to give a brief introduction. Uh, we will look at body language and the cultural boundedness of it. Why is body language important? I'm going to refer to emotional intelligence. Um, we will look at the unconsciousness of this behavior. Facial expressions, it's a universal language, what you can do and what you should not do. Um, and, and then most importantly, I want to show you things that you can pick up when people are talking um, and also what they do, if whether they're lying. So... Uh, we will be looking at a combination of things and right at the end, we will do a quick quiz. So stay around for the quiz because um, I didn't do so well in the quiz. I didn't do so well that I thought I would do and I thought I knew a lot, but it's very, it's vague. It's very difficult. So these things are never clear cut. So it's good that you learn a little bit more about it. Okay, so um, the introduction of what it is that we're going to do today. So body language. Uh, refers to nonverbal signals that we use to communicate. So according to experts, these nonverbal signals makes out a huge part of our daily communication. So from our facial expressions to our body movements, the things we don't say can still convey volumes of information. So it's been suggested that body language may account for between 60 to 65 percent of all communication. Some research even suggests between 80 and 90. So we all know that body language um, um, it accounts for a big, big part of when we communicate. So, for example, when doing presentations, most presenters focus their presentation time on the words they will say. Uh, but research shows that the body language accounts for as much as 55% of um, a message total impact. Meanwhile, your tone of voice accounts for 38% of the impact and your actual words only 7%. So that's, it's slightly shocking, but um, it's about how you convey it, how confident you look and how you talk. All right, so before we start with, with, with everything, I wanted to um, touch on a few examples first. Now, this is uh, also what inspired my interest in the um, body language and the nonverbal communication that we have is in, in all these cases that we see, especially some of these famous situations, um, uh, that we that we all see um, on on the internet about um, people lying and trying to conceal it. So we're just going to run through a few examples because I just want to warm you up in terms of um, what it is that we want to look for. Okay, so uh, a lot of you may remember Michael Peterson. He was he was known or he is known as the staircase killer. Um, and you'll see on every slide, I've got a YouTube link for you right at the bottom. I will forward you this presentation afterwards and you can go and look at this because this is where the body language experts analyzes the situation or the um the person so do yourself a favor and and go and um, research some of this because it's very very interesting now michael peterson for me is a very interesting case because um after a lot of recent research uh, or, or evidence that came out um, he actually, in my personal opinion, looks less guilty. But if you look at his body language, he just looks very guilty. So it's very, very confusing. Um, so I still, I don't really know. Um, but as I mentioned, with the, with the new evidence, he, he, it, it looks less guilty. But then if you look at the way that he defends himself, it just looks very weird. 
Um, so Michael Peterson is an American novelist who was convicted in 2003 of murdering his second wife, Kathleen Peterson, on December 9, 2001. So on December, in, it was in 2001, she was found dead at the bottom of a staircase in their home by Michael. He claimed that she's fallen accidentally and he discovered her too late to save her. So because there was a lot of contradictory evidence and witness statements, a lot of emphasis was placed on body language and what he was saying, because there was a lot of confusing things. Um, I, I just don't think the, the whole case went down very well. So in this particular documentary, and this is the link that I put down below for you here, you can see when he talks, um, when he gets negative information, he looks away because um, they say that once, when you hear something negative about yourself, you almost don't want to hear it, so you will sort of go, in, um, in this direction. Uh, interestingly enough with him, there's quite a few times where he uses a very high pitched voice, like it sounds like he's mimicking shock. It just sounds like acting. And it could be an indication of lying, but it's so weird. You have to look at it for yourself because it just looks false. But um, then there was evidence that's showing, you know, evidence to the contrary, but maybe you must look at it for yourself and decide what you think. Um, another thing that people do when um, they want to lie is they don't deny what was happening. They don't deny, they don't say explicitly, I did not do it or it wasn't me or whatever, but they will, there's no um, definite denial and they fish of facts. So he's unsure of what the interviewer knows. So they're trying to get things together in order to make up a lie. Um, another thing that people also do when they, and this you will also find in, in normal interviews um, or in general cases, if you confront someone that you think was lying to you, they will repeat what it is that you said to them. So, for example, the interviewer in this case asked, um, there is a written statement. Then this guy, Michael Peterson, will repeat a statement. I would like to see that statement. So it's sort of to prolong and to play for time in order for them to... Um, to make up a new story because once again they don't know what the interviewer knows. Now in this particular documentary it was also noticed that it was a documentary with cameras on these guys so this guy was also aware that there was a camera on him so he could have been acting a little bit he could have been the high-pitched voice could have been part of him acting so once again it, it's very interesting how like what is real and what is not. But do yourself a favor and, and um, uh, research this particular case in more detail. Another case that I found very, very interesting, and this is what sparked my interest in the, the body language in particular, was the actions of Chris Watts. Now, I am no expert. I don't know a lot at all. But I can tell you when I saw this interview, it was just eerie. It was creepy because the way that he was talking felt to me like it was a casual conversation around a bright place fear, bright place fire. So the whole story of Chris Watts, to give you a quick overview, um, the Watts family murders occurred in the early morning hours of August, uh, in August in 2018. Initially, he lied extensively about the murder. So while being interviewed by the police, he then admitted that he um, killed his pregnant wife, Shannon Watts. He later admitted to killing the daughters because um, he had two daughters already. So the, so that she was pregnant with the third child, but he killed the two daughters as well by smothering them with a blanket. Um, so end of 2018, he pled guilty because he was he was find, found out. Of, of course, the evidence was very, very clear. So he was sentenced um, to five life sentences without the possibility of parole. So um, uh, very clear cut, very bad situation. Um, but now the body... Body experts, body language experts. This is this is what I saw from this. I, I had to go into this a little bit more detail because me as a layman looking at the way that he was talking thought that it was almost ridiculous. But incredibly cold, detached, slightly probably psychopathic. So I looked at the um, notes that was made by Cliff Lancey. So body language expert Cliff Lancey indicated that Chris's facial expressions caught on camera when believed arrive um, to his home betrayed his lies even before the arrest. So please do yourself a favor and look at this. The link is below there um, so that you can see the way that he's talking. So if you look at Chris Watts' uh, face in more detail in this picture, 
um, on the left hand side, it, it's sort of normal, but on the right hand side, um, this is what, what they're saying, what is happening while he was talking. Um, he would say, I just want them back. And he's talking about his children here. You see the lip corners raised, almost like a slight smile, and the eyes tighten. So the eyes almost go into a natural smile. So it is a natural smile. So later down, we will also talk about when is something a fake smile, when is a real smile. This is actually quite genuine, but that is a um, combination of these two muscles are indicator of genuine pleasure. That is like a real, it's genuine. So it's quite dark. I think that's maybe the psychopathic um, part of it. Um, so in this interview, you will also see that he stands with his feet apart, with his arms like this, and he's swaying a little bit, almost like he's standing next to a bright face fire and talking to his friends. And he's talking like this. So the, the arms that's crossed shows anxiety. And then when he talks to them, he sort of makes a gesture like that. Now, according to the body language experts, um, they say that that literally confirms that I have no confidence in what I've just said. So obviously in the interview, when you talk to people, if someone goes like that, it doesn't mean that they are lying. Um, what they also tell us is you want to look at a combination of things, not just one thing. Um, but this was quite a, a good interview. This is a good an analysis. So do yourself a favor and go and look at this one. It is really creepy. Um, he was also caught out quite quickly. He, he just couldn't um, hold it in for much longer. All right, let's look at one more um, um, example. Obviously, I like this story because as psychologists, we like to check out things and see whether we can pick up some you know, narcissistic things or any, any interesting things in the personality. That's just what we do in our spare time. So I just I followed the, the Harry and Meghan interview um, just because I, I was interested in, in what is really going on here. So there is some interesting body language analysis of, of what it is that actually happened in this interview. Um, so the link is once again at the bottom there. So um, the whole conversation is very interesting. So psychologist Stanton decoded Megan's body language while she conversed about issues um, told um, uh, about these issues, told express that the Duchess of Sussex denoted positive gestures. And this can be established with her hand positioning over Harry's, over Harry's hand throughout the interview. So what she picked up is this also indicated that she noticed that her husband was in need of re reassurance when she made that gesture. gesture. Um, they also said that in this interview, you can see she's comfortable with the camera, whereas he is not. He's not really, that's not his thing. Um, I think he feels more comfortable because she's there with him. So the second point, Harry's body language indicated a lot about the couple's chemistry. So they say he's clearly sorted with her, in love with her. And then lastly, he continued that Harry appears head over heels with Megan and gives gestures indicating that she's with him. So that you pick up, that's quite, it's quite easy to pick that up. But now what I found interesting, um, this particular body language experts that, um, that I watch, it's four guys, they're very, very good. Um, they really know what they're talking about. So um, they had quite an interesting discussion. So let's take the hot topic. The hot topic was the... Um, uh, these experts discussed whether the claim about um, Archie's skin color, um, whether that statement actually happened. So you know the drama that was about uh, whether the color, the color, what, what's a child's uh, skin color going to be? And in, in, there was the whole racial incident. So one expert was quite um, confident that it was a blatant lie, while while the others actually thought that it wasn't. So that was very really interesting. Um, there was also another point where she indicated that she did not look up a husband online. Um, and usually what people would do is, if someone is telling the truth, they, they will say, I didn't do it. But if you sometimes, if you spell it out, I did not look him up online, then it could be an indication of a lie. You will remember Bill Clinton with Monica Lewinsky. Uh, he uh, announced on, on TV, uh, on, in the media, he actually said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. So the spelling out of it does indicate a form of deception. Of course, not always, but um, it could be an, an, an indication of that. Um, 
And then the, the last thing that I just wanted to mention about this interview, it was very interesting for me whenever she was talking, she would say, this and this happened, right? So, um, for example, we would go drink tea, right? And it means that you are building rapport with your interviewer and you are telling them or you want them to accept and assume that whatever you're saying is the truth, almost like it's like a given. That's why you're saying um, this is what we do, right? So I just thought that that was interesting. So um, I, I think the most important thing for me is for, for you guys, when you are in an interview and interviewing, be very aware of the person who tries to build rapport with you from the start. So firstly, it is a good sign because it means that it's a normal person who would like to um, link in in your company. They, they want people to like them. They want to be socially desirable. So that is a, that's like a good thing. It's a positive thing. But be careful that the person doesn't um, reel you into the extent that there's no more objectivity. So um, acknowledge that, that it's a good part because your extroverts or more persuasive or even more manipulative per people will, um, will take it a step further. But if you do a competency-based interview and you know what it is that you like to hear and talk about, you can always keep the conversation back to those points. So that is very important. And if you want the competency-based interview guide, uh, talk to us again, we will send it to you. You follow your interview according to that. And you can control the situation. You control what happens in the interview. All right, so let's, let's start with the actual contents of all of this. So body language are culturally bound. All right, so the only nonverbal behaviors that are universal throughout the world are facial expressions. The expressions of anger, happiness, sadness, disgust, um, surprise and fear are, are basic to all human beings. However, the rest of them are very specific to certain cultures. So differentiate between the two. So in some countries, eye contact is considered respectful. Parents tell their children to look at them when they speak because it's a sign that someone is paying attention to them. However, in some Middle Eastern and Asian cultures, eye contact is avoided because it may signal an inappropriate romantic interest or it may just be um, plain inappropriate in some social interactions. Um, so, moreover, certain hand signals means different things in different cultures, for example, in America and even in South Africa, given the thumbs up is a positive sign. In India, it's the same as giving someone the middle finger. So, I just thought that that would be interesting for you to know. So, why is it important? Research shows that uh, we make crucial decisions about one another, subconsciously evaluating an array of nonverbal cues within the first seven seconds. So, and once um, someone labels you as likable or unlikable, powerful or submissive, everything else that you do will be viewed through that filter. So also be careful of the way that you um, judge someone in an interview because someone that is, that is shy or more quiet, it may come across as uh, more submissive. And uh, because in that first seven seconds, this is when it all happens. So um, make sure that you are very, fair and objective during, during your process. Once again, a competency guide will guide you. You don't have to go on your own tangent. Um, so two people can send over 800 different signals in a 30 minutes negotiation. So how many signals do you think gets passed back and forth in a 45 minutes interview? So if you focus on the verbal exchange alone and ignore the nonverbal element, you stand a high chance of coming away from a negotiation, wondering why in the world you brilliantly constructed a bargaining plan didn't work that the way it was supposed to. So um, it will be very good for you to learn that what it is that you say, but together with what, what it is that's, that's not being said, but focus on your own behavior and as well as the person that you, that you are interviewing. So there are two sets of nonverbal signals and signals that people look for in leaders. Um, you look at status, authority, warmth, and empathy. Um, and for the most effective leaders, employ the right signals at the right time. For example, which means that they realize that the body language signals that work so well when announcing a new business strategy are not necessarily helpful and may in fact sabotage the efforts when building collaborative teams. So, so be aware of when 
do you show what? I just read a very interesting thing the other day. It was in this information that I found online. They said managers must be careful of not smiling too much. So I thought that that was very interesting because of the, the, the message that it sends. So managers um, must not smile too much because it could send a message of being submissive or you are, you are equals what you don't necessarily want. So I'm not trying to make out that the one is more, you know, better than the other one, but but in order for um, for you to still have um, authority and respect, um, I just I just thought that that was uh, it's apparently things something that. Um, that um, well-known leaders do. They don't smile too much. Doesn't mean they don't smile, they don't smile too much. All right, emotional intelligence. So the ability to read body language is related to emotional or social intelligence. Now, it, it's obvious that this makes sense because some people can read others' body language easily and some people cannot do it at all. This all depends on how much you have developed your own emotional intelligence. Um, this is very important because have you ever been in a situation where you can see someone is getting upset and no one is paying attention to it? It's almost like no one can see it. You can maybe see it, but you can't. other people can't see it. That is, you want to become emotionally aware of how you are. The, the more in tune you are with how you are, the more you will be able to read and see how people are. A lot of this has got to do with empathy as well. If you are, if you develop your empathy, you will be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and think, how oh, could they possibly be feeling or thinking now? So for example, if you just have empathy for someone coming for an interview, you may expect them to be a little bit nervous. They may not show it, but you you would put yourself in their shoes with some, um, some things. All right, so even experts can't interpret body language effectively 100% of the time. So be careful of that. It's not an easy thing to um, evaluate. There is a lot of research about the different meanings of the, the uh, nonverbal communication. A lot of experts may get it right about 80% of the time. That's still not perfect. But there are definitely mistakes sometimes. For example, someone looks that looks at their watch a lot may come across as not wanting to be there, but it could at the same time be a very time conscious person or just a very conscientious person. So therefore body language is very ambiguous. Never in an interview focus on one thing. You wanna look at a range of things. Never look at one thing, it's not going to be good enough. You may lose a good person if you, if you do that. Okay, it's unconscious behavior. So it's unconscious for both the sender and the receiver. For example, um, you could be concentrating and focusing while listening. And while you're doing that, you can have an expression of disapproval on your face because of your concentration. So, but it looks like disapproval. Now, um, something that goes a little bit deeper than body language and facial expressions is called micro expressions. So we can probably not really pick that up, but your experts um, that I've spoken about um, earlier, they focus on micro expressions. So micro expressions are a better predictor of true feelings, but these are very, very short. This is, we're talking half a second to four seconds. So micro expressions are very brief facial expressions that last only a fraction of a second and they're a sign of repressing or concealing an emotion. That's often why we maybe can see if someone is really shocked or um, is really um, hurt or whatever, that, that second that you can see that it's really difficult to fake. So they say that the micro expression are actually a little bit more accurate. Um, but you have to be very aware to pick this up. So there's an interesting study in the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, and he cites a lot of fascinating studies, and one of them examines micro expressions of romantic couples on a video. He had them talking about random things such as their dog, current events, something that wouldn't evoke negative interactions between the two of them. Then he looked at their interactions frame by frame to, e to view each person's micro expression. So just from looking at this information, from their body language, he was able to predict which couples would last and which ones would break up with about um, an 80% accuracy rate. So if you want to learn more about that, it's my uh, Malcolm Gladwell, and the book's name is Blink. So for many, um, uh, for example, many of us have a nervous tick that reveals 
themselves in a variety of ways, such as touching your head or con constantly adjusting your glasses or jewelry or wringing your hands. So we all have our own little um, little habits or little things that we do. Often it's very unconscious. You can become conscious about these things the more emotionally aware you are. You're aware of your actual physical body. Be aware of it. Be aware of what it is that you're doing. Be aware of what your hands are doing. And as soon as you go like this, be aware that you're going to put them down calmly. And if you go like this again, be aware that you put them down. So you can practice it as well. Okay, let's look at facial expressions. Understanding body language is important, but it is also essential to pay attention to other cues such as the context. So in many cases, you should look at signals as a group rather than focusing on a single action. So I've mentioned that before. Don't look at one thing. If someone puts their hand in front of their mouth, that means that they're lying. It's, it's just one thing. You want to look at a lot of things. So here's what to look for when you're trying to interpret body language. So in some cases, our facial expression may reveal our true feelings about a particular situation. While you say that you're feeling fine, the look on your face may tell people um, otherwise. So, so listen to what the face looks like and what it is that they're saying and what the rest of the body is doing. So it is a universal language. The expression on a person's face can even help determine if we trust or believe what the individual is saying. Uh, that's, that's where we all come from, is we want to see whether this person's credible or not. So one study found that the most trustworthy facial expression involved a slight raise of the eyebrow and a slight smile. So this expression, the researchers suggest, conveys both friendliness and confidence. So very relaxed, open, open face, a relaxed, open face. Um, facial expressions are also among the most universal forms of body language. Expression used to go many fear, anger, sadness, happiness are the same throughout the world. That is very interesting. It just comes normally to us. It's just the same thing. It's very interesting. Um, researcher Paul Ackman has found support for the universality of a variety of facial expressions tied to particular emotions, including joy, anger, fear, um, and surprise. So um, there's quite a lot of of research backing that up. Okay, so um, when you're in an, oh, you don't even have to only just be in an interview. When, when um, you want to focus about what someone is saying to you, um, you can pay attention to the following. First, lips. So tightening the lips can be an indicator of distaste, disapproval, or disgust. Like if you go like this. What, what they've also found is you will see in the Chris Watts interview as well, as soon as they go like this, Okay, not smacking like that. I mean, more just just um, um, bringing in their lips. Uh, it's almost like they know what they are saying is not the truth, and they almost want to conceal it, almost like they want to swallow it. So look at a lot of the interviews with, with killers or uh, suspected killers. They will go like this, almost like they didn't want to say what they just said. Um Lip biting, that we all know. That can be worriedness, anxiousness, stressness. Covering of the mouth, people want to hide an emotional reaction. They say that people touch their face or their nose when they lie. They've got, they've got no reason really why they do that, but that, it's quite a lot if you, if you go like this. Um, turned up or down, slight ch changes in the mouth can also be a subtle indicator of what the person's feeling. When the mouth is slightly turned up, it means the person's feeling happy, optimistic. On the other hand, a slightly down turned mouth is an indicator of sadness, disapproval, even outright grimace. So um, this is this is quite interesting that the pursing of the lips and covering of the mouth, because it also means I, I don't want to say what I did. So if someone talks like this, it could it could also be that they, they don't really, they're unsure maybe, or they don't want to say what it is that they're saying. All right, I'm going to run through a few behaviors of things that you that you can do. So one of the most common questions that people have when it comes to body language is what do I do with my hands? So um, and one of them, a, a lot of people um, cross their hands in front of them like this. So you'll see once again, Chris Watts did that um, immediately. So even though he was sort of trying to look all cool and calm, it, it means that he was defending. He was, he was not feeling as strong. So it sends a message of defensiveness and unapproachability. It also betrays nervousness and lack of confidence. So when you see you go like this, just relax your arms next to yourself. So send the opposite message, open your chest and your arms to keep a straight back. The best thing to do is keep your arms next to your body. Another big no-no is crossing your legs. Now, I find this interesting. I always used to think this shows that you're quite confident. But 
especially if you're doing a presentation of speaking in front of people, sitting cross-legged like this communicates a lack of professionalism and slight um, nervousness. I didn't know this. I thought that it was okay, maybe in a normal meeting, but um, okay. People could interpret it, it from you like that. So be aware of that. Um, touching any part of the face or neck in low position like this is indicator of anxiety, nervousness, or lack of control. It could also be, you know, someone could be listening to you like that. I've seen that before. Um, but but when, when you are presenting to a client, if you want to create positive, keep your hands away from your face. Wringing your hands if you're washing them is a sign of discomfort. Oh, that a lot of us do. I, a lot of people do that. So people know that you're probably a little bit nervous. Another defensive gesture is placing your hands in your pocket. So I always used to think this shows quite a little bit of a relaxedness, but I think it's trying to conceal maybe powerlessness or shyness. Um, I think it depends also on your movements in front of an audience, because I've seen people do that moving around and they do look quite comfortable. But remember how people may interpret your way of doing it. All right, um, and then people tend to naturally pay more attention to those who look them in the eyes. On the other hand, avoiding eye, commu eye contact communicates lack of confidence, openness, and trust. Um, I think that's that's quite, um, it could be quite a Western thing um, because there are other cultures where it's respect, where you don't just look someone in the eye. So be aware of different cultures as well. Uh, but I know in, in the Western world, um, that's how we do business is you, you want to show that you are um, truthful and honest, but be aware of different cultures, maybe approaching this differently. Um, all right. And then when, uh, when presenting, some presenters resort to a trick of fixing their stare on a single person or spot, but an audience can quickly tell when someone is avoiding eye contact with them. I've had that before where a speaker looks at just at one point, sometimes feel like they're only looking at you. Uh, to me, it does look like they may be a little bit nervous. Instead, trying to look at different people in different spots in your audience um, so you make people feel important, sending a message of self-assuredness and confidence. All right, also the way that you can stand. So another way to communicate lack of confidence or security is to stand in the same spot during the entire presentation as if there were invisible walls restricting you from walking around. One of the rules of high power body language is to take up as much space or the territory is needed. So walk around. You'll see that your very confident, um, motivational type of speakers, they move around, they show, they um, engage with the audience. So moving around during appropriate movements in your presentation will not only make the audience more attentive, it will also keep your mind more alert and you can channel your nervous energy. Just make sure to avoid wearing any high type of shoes, you know, like stilettos or something that may increase your chances of falling or tripping. Right. Um, and then hand gestures. Um, any gesture used during a presentation should be used either to emphasize a point, describing something, convey an emotion, express a mood, or prompt the audience to take a specific action. Most presenters However, use the same gesture over and over again without any clear communication. I can sometimes do that. I will do the same thing over and over. Um, it is because I'm really just trying to get a message across, but I, I assume it can be irritating. Um, this only distracts your audience instead of helping to convey your message. So try to plan varied gestures beforehand that helps highlight your main points. So even if you consciously think about them before your presentation, use it in a controlled and a smooth manner so that it's not too much. All right, and then standing firm with your feet hip width apart sends a clear message of stability and confidence. Shifting your weight from foot to foot or standing with your feet too close together, however, communicates uncertainty and nervousness. If you look at the Chris Watts, if you see how he sways, it's almost like he's trying to make himself feel better like, <laughs> like this. Um, and I think this is the last example. We've all seen the figurative fig leaf position. So this actually does not show um, that I'm calm and, and, and competent. The, both hands clasped in front of the body, forming the shape of a fig leaf covering the groin area. This sends a message of discomfort, shyness, suggesting defensiveness, and the need to protect the most sensitive and vulnerable parts of the body. Once again, the arms next to the body is just the most relaxed and open. Okay, now we're getting to the interesting part. This is what it is that you've all been waiting for. 
So when somebody's lying in an interview, so I've got some very, very interesting information. Yes, some of it is too detailed. You will probably not be able to zoom into to that level, but just know about it, you know, can't, can't do any harm. Um, most people have no better than a 50-50% chance of detecting deception. So that's not so great. You know, you could um, think that you know something over here, lose something over there. So um, um, the more you learn, the better. So the, some of the main things, too much or too little eye contact. Overemphasizing details or avoiding detail. So um, one of the, the things where they, the, the woman that was um, involved in the Bill Cosby um, issue, they said that the incredible detail that they actually told um, was so convincingly accurate, the, the, the detail of what is what is happening. And um, something in that actually, um, they picked up a pattern and they could see that the women were actually um, talking the truth. So either avoiding um, detail, um, or, or even overemphasizing details that sort of that's that's sort of not relevant. That is what it is that you want to look at here. But um, usually, like for example, in the Bill Cosby um, case, um, the detail that the women were, were were telling was really telling that it was was accurate. Um, and then fidgeting a lot, fidgeting, touching the nose. For some reason, touching the nose is is that's just always been like that. The mouth purse, and that's what I told you before, when you press your lips together as if you didn't want to say it. Um, speech hesitations. Remember, that can also be nervousness, but pick up, especially if you do a competency-based interview um, on specific questions, you'll, you will know when the person has got an example on that particular, particular competence or on that particular um, topic. Um, you will know when they're trying to make something up, they're hesitant, especially if on the previous questions they were quite consistent and smooth and they could give uh, examples. That is why a competency-based interview is so good because you can pick up the differences. Um, looking up or down, maybe looking around, trying to win some time in order to make something up. Um, answers, questions that was not asked. This one is very important. This happens in interviews constantly. Talking about things that was not asked, getting off topic, um, talking about things, and, and you can get caught up in it. That's why with a competence-based interview, you want to get them back to what it is that you asked. You want to get them back. Uh, may repeat phrases or words, um, and that is where um, I, the, the previous um, Michael Peterson, where someone would say, someone made a statement, and he would say, a statement, I would like to see that statement. So they, they say that that is... Um, stretching it out, trying to figure out who knows what. Um, another interesting thing is focusing on when they stop talking about themselves. So that is also an interesting one. Okay, this I found very interesting. So this is maybe a little bit more for your investigators, like investigating crime. So you'll see here and there, I talk about investigator versus interviewer. But, you know, I still think that we can because um, you will you will not just have interviews in, in your job, you may also have discussions with employees or people about things that happen. So the lack of self-reference. Truthful people make frequent use of the pronoun I. So for example, I arrived at home at 6.30. The phone was ringing as I unlocked the front door. Um, I walked straight to the kitchen. I talked to my mother. So that is um, how you describe an action. A deceptive person will minify, minimize a re reference to themselves if it didn't happen. For example, um, the safe was left unlocked rather than I left the safe unlocked. Or you'll say the shipment was authorized rather than I authorized the, the shipment because you actually didn't do it. So you're trying to avoid saying that you do it. So um, uh, the last example here, can you tell me about reconciling the bank statement? And the answer is, you know, you try to identify all the outstanding checks and deposits in transit. But sometimes when you're just really busy, you post the differences and to suspend the account. So you, you sort of refer to that's what one should do. So I found this one very interesting. When you don't say, I, I um, do it, you, you say one should you know, do that. Okay, the verb tense I also found very interesting because what happens here, truthful people usually describe historical events in the past tense. Deceptive people sometimes refer to past events as if the event were occurring in the present. So 
Um, let me show you that, look at the bullet points I've written down here. So look at how the sentences change. After closing the store, I put the cash pouch in my car and I drove to the bank on Elm Street. It was raining so hard, I had to drive slowly. I entered the parking lot and drove around to the back to the night depository slot. When I stopped the car, I rolled my wind, uh, down my window. A guy jumps out of the bushes and yells at me. I can see he has a gun. He grabs the cash pouch and runs away. The last I saw him, he was headed south on Elm Street. After he was gone, I called the police on my cell phone. Can you see that he starts with that is what happened and then it moves into what is happening because they have to make up a story. I thought that this was quite, um, quite interesting. All right, answering questions with questions. So I find it interesting because they say even liars don't want to lie. Um, outright lies carry a risk of detection. So before answering a question with a lie, a deceptive person will usually try to avoid answering the question at all. One common method of dodging a question is to respond a question with one's own. So, um, and I see this a lot. I, I know it sounds funny, but I watch the Judge Judy show frequently and I like how she catches them out when they lies, but they say this so often. Why would I steal from my brother? Or do I seem like the kind of person who would do something like that? Why would I do something like that? Almost trying to justify them to get to think in this, like trying to get them to think in their way. So don't you think somebody would have to be pretty stupid to remove cash from the registered drawer? So this is quite telltale. You see this actually quite a lot. Equivocation. So this would just means the subject avoids and interviews questions by filling um, his or her statements with expressions of uncertainty, weak modifiers, and vague expressions. So uh, they don't want to commit. They answer vaguely, and they don't want to commit. So for example, non-committal verbs are, I think, I believe, I guess, I suppose, I figure, I assume. Equivocating adjectives and adverbs are sort of, almost, mainly, perhaps, maybe, about. And then vague qualifiers uh, would be, you might say, more or less. So interesting enough, I also see this on the Judge Judy show. I um, apologize for having to refer to that, but uh, it's just very interesting. They use exactly this terminology. They answer questions with questions. Um, so you can, you can see when you're trying not to commit. All right, and then, uh, sorry, the oaths. I just want to touch on this one as well. So uh, especially when people go into overdrive, um, they would very much like to convince you that they didn't do it. So someone that's innocent is not going to try and convince you by swearing or whatever because they, they know that it's the truth. Someone that's deceptive may say, I swear, it's on my honor. Uh, my God is a witness, cross my heart. I had a friend who said he knew that his wife was having an affair and she said to him, I swear on my children's lives. So it's very oh, much in overdrive. It's very much like, I want to convince you. A, 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 a truthful person would not want to convince you because they, they're actually quite comfortable already. So be aware of this one. You see it a lot. Euphemisms, many languages offers alternatives. Um, so a euphemism, portray the subject's behavior in a more favorable light and minimize the, any harm the subject's actions might have caused. So investigators should look at euphemisms like missing instead of stolen, borrowed instead of took, bumped instead of hit, warned instead of threatened. I love this one because this, it's brilliant because I didn't, I didn't steal it. I, I just borrowed it or um, it, you know, it went missing. So euphemisms, trying to soften what it is that they did. Alluding to actions, this is when someone say, um, I tried to back up my computer and put away my papers every night before going home. Last Tuesday, I decided to copy my files onto the network drive and started putting my papers in my desk drawer. I also needed to lock the customer list in the office safe. So the question is, did the employee back up a computer? Did she copy her files onto the drive? Did she put her papers in the desk? Well, she, she's saying that is what one should do. That is, so uh, this is alluding to action. So they're not saying that I did it. They're alluding to the fact that they, that they um, should be doing that. This is also a very important one. Okay, before we get to our little quiz, I just want to run through a few things. These are, these are very easy things that you can pick up in an interview. 
Um, so when someone is lying in an interview, look at the eye movement. Once again, look at a combination of things, not just one thing. But you want to look at when they're lying about an example of what they have done before. Because a competency-based interview is about giving you an example of what they've done before. So eye movement, a candidate's eyes tell you a lot about their truthfulness. If a candidate won't look you in the eyes, they might be trying to hide something. See how long they look at you. It could also, you could also be shy, so don't misinterpret they might look away or frequently shift their gaze away. This could also be a, a sign of shyness. Um, body movement. So let's let's look at this one. If a candidate is fidgeting a lot, they, may, they might be lying. This can include tapping or shuffling their feet, playing with their fingers or shifting in their chair, especially when someone goes like that and they're trying to think of an, of an example. They get, they're playing for time to get something ready. So sudden movements may also be a sign of lying. For example, a candidate who was calm and relatively still suddenly starts fiddling with their hands. Lip biting is another sign that someone might be lying. It might indicate that they are nervous about what they're saying. Also look for gestures that conflict with what the candidate is saying. For example, if a candidate confirms that they have 10 years of experience and excel in the job duties, um, but while the can is lying, they are shuffling their feet and shaking their head. They might be telling you that the can is lying. So you, you will see a lot of interviews. People will say yes, but they'll say yes like this. It means that they're actually thinking no. So they're doing the opposite. Um, changes in voice. So listen to the candidate's voice as they talk. How they say things um, is just as important as what they say. Changes in the candidate's vo vocal pitch might be an indication of the line, you know, when you're talking like this. And then I start answering like this, you know, when the, the pitch goes up. For example, a candidate's voice might get higher or lower if they're lying. Also, the candidate's tone might change if they are lying. They might get louder, become monotone, whisper, or make another tone adjustment. Sudden pauses and stammering are also possible lies of the um, lies and deception. A candidate might be trying to stall for time so that they can think through their story. This is what is so brilliant about the competency-based interview. You will ask a specific, a specific question about a competency over here. They will give you an example of when they've done something like that before. They may give you for the next question another good example. Maybe you get to a question of analytical thinking or whatever, and the guy cannot give you a, a good example. And then you'll see it'll take them a little bit longer. They, will, they, will, they won't refer to what has happened. They will start saying what should happen, um, how it should be, because that's what one does. And then I would do that when, when the, the, the verbing changes. But you'll, you'll clearly see that they're trying to answer it. So don't hold it too much against them. Just know that they don't have experience it. They, they're trying to answer it. So don't just don't hold it against them. They are trying to answer something that they just don't have experience in. But you can then score them according, or, or, accordingly. As you can see, yeah, they did well. Yeah, they did well. This one in particular, not so well. Maybe the next one well again. But you can clearly see the difference. That's why if you have a structured interview, you can pick that up. Responses, pay attention to what the candidate actually says. So listen for the details in the candidate's responses. If there is a lack of details, it might be because the candidate doesn't have any real information to support what they're saying. You will see this in a competency-based interview where they, they can't give you the details. They may have given you a very good example previously, um, but in the next one, the example is just vague. The details is sort of all over the place. You're not really sure where they're referring to. Also watch out for the opposite. If a candidate overshares, it might be because they're trying to cover up lack of their own information. So overshare, you also see it overshares and it sort of drifts away. If you have to bring them back, you can see, you know, it, go on to the next question. Make sure what the candidate says matches what they said on their resume. If the interview responses don't match the resume, um, they may have lied in the interview or used common uh, resume lies. Okay. Okay, so while the tips, let me just see what the time looks like. All right, perfect. We've got 10 minutes left. We're going to do a quick quiz. Um, so while the above tips can help you spot someone lying in an interview, they aren't always accurate indicators of deception. While some verbal and, and nonverbal signs can tell you um, that a candidate is lying, they may not be a true indicator for all people. To combat this, observe how the candidate behaves as a whole. Watch for their body language and responses that deviated from their norm. These deviations can tell you more than the typical lying signs. Remember, candidates may be stressed as they're being interviewed. As a result, they may act strangely. I've seen strange things. 
um, this is why it's always good if you have uh, some psychometric assessment combined with it because then you can see through it, you can see the, the true person. Um, the person can, they could be shifty because they're nervous, not because they're lying. So, so just, be, um, just be compassionate as well. You could, um, should also consider the different body language norms of other cultures. So remember the eye contact thing, the handshake thing. You may um, consider to be lying behavior might be normal, desired. Um, what you may consider to be lying behavior might be normal, desired behavior in another culture. Okay, so let's do, let's do a quiz. So um, please share if you've got any questions as we go along, uh, write it in the um, Q&A section over here, then we'll address it at the end. So I've got a few questions here. For you. So you don't have to write it down. You can just get a number in your head and see whether you were right or wrong. So, okay, if you look at this picture over here, what does this man's body language portray? Is this shame? Is this confidence? Is it sadness or nervousness? So choose one. I actually, I actually think I had two options here because I, I wasn't actually totally sure. Um, so get your, your answer ready. I'm going to give you the, the correct answer just now. So in this case, the answer is nervousness. So nail biting is a common body language behavior that helps someone relieve tension and anxiety during stressful situations. So typically, the, I don't know, the hand goes to the mouth whenever people are nervous. All right, so let's look at question number two. If someone's feet is pointing towards you, do they show interest or disinterest in you? So look at this picture. If someone's feet is pointing towards you, do they show interest or disinterest in you? All right, let's see the answer. So feet pointing towards someone is generally a good sign of mutual attraction or interest. In large group settings, the most charismatic person will usually have the most feet pointing towards them. However, if a person feels uncomfortable or dis disinterested and wants to leave, the feet may be pointing away towards the exit. So that is, that's interesting. You could maybe see when you're talking to an audience who's, who wants to leave. All right, this one could be tricky. When someone is sitting in a position, in this position, what does that mean? So slightly slouched forward, the hands in this position, what does that mean? So is that happiness? Is that fear? Is it confidence? Is it excitement? All right, so get your answer ready in your head. Is this happiness? Is this fear? Is this confidence? Or is this excitement? All right, so the right answer is, Confidence. So the hand gesture is called steepling. So steepling occurs when someone is typically feeling confident and in charge. The higher someone holds the steeple, the more confident they feel. So you will rarely see steepling from a subordinate in front of his boss or someone who's unconfident in what they are saying. So if someone is steepling in sales negotiation, it may feel like they have the upper hand. So I have heard about people um, sitting like this when they feel uncertain or whatever, they feel like this, and it actually um, creates, a, a, um, even if they don't feel confident, it creates a, a feeling that they are. So it's a good trick to fall back on if you feel a little bit nervous, you know, <laughs> do they? All right, next question. Is this a genuine smile? So I was sort of tricked here because I, I thought so, and then I didn't think so because I do see I see a broad smile and I see the eyebrows lifted. Um, so decide for yourself: is this a genuine smile or is this a fake smile? So because uh, the eyes looks very friendly and open, actually, but this is a fake smile. So a real genuine smile typically has an indicator that is known as the Duchenne marker. So this is what causes the corner of the eyes to form wrinkles. And you know the little crow's feet. When you see the crow's feet, that is a, a genuine smile. So if a person is smiling but lacks this indicator, they may be smiling just to be light. So we all know, you know, how you smile when you actually don't really, you know, it can be a good smile because um, his, his eyes to me look, looks quite relaxed. But in this case, you want to see some wrinkles. Okay, let's look at question five. What does it mean when someone puts a pen, glasses, or nails in their mouth when they're talking? So in, in some cases, you would think that it could be that I'm really listening attentively. So, but in general, it is actually um, considered to be anxious, tensed, or stressed. 
So, so be aware that when you're in a meeting, when you actually may be trying to indicate that you are listening attentively, uh, when anything goes near the mouth, people view it as anxious. You could be anxious or tense or stressed. All right, let's look at question number six. Which part of the body do people touch to indicate sincerity? So look at each and every picture here. Which part of the body do people touch to indicate sincerity? All right, I'm going to give you a second there. And in this case, the answer is touching the heart. So it's an old cliche, touching the heart certain, certainly rings true here. Touching the chest with both hands is a body language skew that, that shows sincerity, honesty, and sympathy. Okay, and then question seven, does someone with closed arms demonstrate anxiousness or nervousness? So if you look at this picture, it sort of confuses you. But the general consensus, the general consensus is when the arms go up, that, um, that people are usually a little bit closed off. Uh, but it could also mean, in, like in this case, this guy looks very confident. Yet yeah, It can mean that someone is angry in deep concentration, feeling cold, simply resting their arms. Um, in the case of Chris Watts, I, I think it was almost like a, a way to sort of soothe himself. If you look at the video, uh, it does not necessarily mean someone is closed off, but I, I think it really depends maybe on the context and uh, um, where they find themselves. So question eight, I think this is our last question. Um, so which of the following body language gestures signals anger? The head tilted downwards, eyebrows lowered, eyes narrowed, mouth to the side, hands on the hips. Which one or which of the following, it could be more than one, signals anger? So if you look at this picture, which one of this signals anger to you? So the head tilted downwards, the eyebrows lowered, eyes narrowed, mouth to the side, hands on the hips. So in this case, all of the below. So in, in this case, the, the whole thing, I know it's, it's a corny picture, but all of them suggest that. Okay, good. So now we are almost at the end. And um, I want you to, to put any questions in the, um, the Q&A box if you've got anything, if there's anything that you thought was interesting or unclear. And, and remember that I can send you this presentation. I can also send you a competency-based questionnaire and um, um, to help you with your interviews. And um, it will be interesting for you to, to maybe YouTube some of these videos that, that we were talking about today. So. Um, I hope you found it interesting and please keep an eye out for when we have more on emotional intelligence. We're going to have, I think in July, we will have an emotional intelligence webinar. We will have another stress management webinar that is very, very good. Um, and so keep an eye out for all the future webinars that there is. Okay, let me see. There is a question. Let me see what is the question. Sorry. Okay, so someone said, please um, email the presentation. So absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. It was very interesting and insightful. Have a wonderful day. So I'm glad you found it insightful because I also found it insightful, especially if you start um, researching what happens out there in the media where people are, are suspected of murders and things like that. Um, the way people lie is uh, interesting and a lot of people do the same type of thing. So you don't have to be an expert use the tools and the resources that you have. For example, do a competency-based interview, do psychometric testing if you can, um, do reference checks, um, do qualification and history, um, history checks, do all of those things to help you together with what it is that, that you determine. So you don't have to be perfect in everything and know whether someone is lying. You want to, to use all of your tools. Okay, and expressions are very intriguing. It, it is because it, it can also be misleading. So be also aware that you don't make assumptions, maybe get clarification from the person. And I'm glad you found it interesting. I'm really glad about that because I, I also, um, I thought it would be very interesting for, for people in the workplace. So remember just to also be very, be, be objective. Don't, don't be too subjective when you do this. If someone does a particular action, um, um, you know, attack them for maybe lying. So be, be, be very careful of that. Okay, any other questions?
Now is your chance. All right, and send your email to, um, there is also our details. Oh my goodness. Yeah, th that is our details if you want to contact us directly. And uh, otherwise, you can also speak to HR Talk. You're welcome to talk to them and we will get hold of you. Otherwise, this is our contact details that you can get hold of us if, if you need anything. So, um, and then I hope to see you in our future webinars. Let me see that it looks like there may be one more question. Uh, we're gonna practice psych, oh, this is, a, this is an uh, old one. Let me just see. Okay. Okay, so there's a good, a good question here. We're using plat online platforms to this day to conduct interviews. How can body language be used on such platforms? You would have to, the thing is, it is limited online like this. It's very limited. So you can only do what it is that you can do um, and make use of additional information like reference checks, other additional checks, maybe do psychometric testing or something. But Online like this, it is quite, it is a little bit more difficult. Listen also to tone of voice, listen to what is said. Um, and there's people saying this was very interesting. I love that. Um, and there's people asking for the competency-based questionnaires. So please send me, please send me an email or make um, contact with HR Talk and, um, um, and we will send it to you. So please, please send, um, your details to me so that um, I can send it to you. Okay, I mean, may I please have information. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Everyone can get the competency-based questionnaire. It's gonna, it's gonna help you a lot. And someone asked you, where can I practice psychometric tests? That's not something you can practice because the psychometric test is, um, they test you as you are right now in this moment. So if you can't, you can't um, practice that. You must have confidence in yourself that that when you go do it, that they are just going to measure you the way that you are. All right. Let me see if there's any other questions. Okay. Psychometrics are very helpful to make decisions in recruitment. V absolutely, definitely so. So I, I agree with that. Together with everything else that you can do, it's very, very, um, very important. Okay, so I think that is the last question. So everyone, I hope to see you next time. Please log in. This was It was um, a lot of fun doing this with you. So please log in. Keep an eye out for your next free um, uh, webinar. So please, I hope to see you again. Okay, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.